My name is Marcia Robinson, and we are recording an oral history with William H. Schaefer, John Sawyer, and John Peterson, members of the Knoll Foundation Board. This is part of the Sweet Mummery's Oral History Project to mark the 50th anniversary of the Miami University Middletown, Ohio campus. This interview is taking place on May 5th, 2017 at the Gardner Harvey Library. Do I have your consent and permission to proceed with this interview? You do. Yes. yes. Thank you. So can we start with some of your connections to the Middletown campus? Um, and then we'll go on to Mrs. Knoll later. But do you have memories of how this campus has touched your life personally? Such as kids in college or any programs like that? Well, I'll start. Um, I was in college uh, at the time this campus was built back in the middle town. What was it, the middle 1960s, I believe. Yeah, early 60s. Early. And, uh, so I wasn't in town at that time. However, uh, once I graduated from college, came back here to the family real estate business, uh, raised a family, and in that process, my two children, Johnny and Kristen, uh, both came over to this campus, which is about five minutes from our home, for uh, kids in college. It was a kindergarten, grade school-based program where young students were invited to participate on the college campus on Saturday mornings and they had different programs and activities for these young people and it's not only good for the students it was it, it was good for the parents they got involved and uh, a lot of us probably wouldn't have been involved with Miami Middletown had it not been for that. Do you have any other family members who attended this college? Y yes uh, I do. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all my wife and I graduated from Miami Oxford uh, many, many years ago. And of course, uh, we, we lived here when uh, this campus was started. And uh, we became involved with, uh, I was in business here, and we became involved with the fundraising and uh, many things early on. Uh, my daughter, Nancy, uh, graduated from Miami Oxford, but she took a lot of classes here and uh, worked on her master's here at the university. So we've been, my wife and I have been involved with this campus since the beginning, really. Yeah, I don't have any children or family member that have direct connection. I came, I'm not a native, came to town 50 years ago, this spring actually, 1967. That was at the tail end of the fundraising uh, came with Armco. Armco brought me to town. And Armco played a strong role in employee participation in the funding of the campus here, of MUM. Well, well let's pick up with that and keep sure. going. Um, in another interview, uh, we have a phrase called community-minded people. And I have students who do not know what that phrase means. Would you explain what a community-minded person is and give us examples of that? So you said Armco helped with the uh, funding through employees. Yes, and of course I had payroll deduction set up for contributions, so I made it very easy <laughs> uh, and provided literature and so on. And helped staff the development effort also, part of it. Do you have examples? <laughs> well, they, they provided uh, let the employees have time to come to campus or go downtown to meetings and so on and encourage that. That was just a development effort. But Armco at the time uh, was very community minded and, and sort of had the thought that what's good for the community is good for Armco and uh, operated that way. Back then, so Armco and the locally owned paper companies here, which made up most of the industrial base, uh, they not only expected you to uh, work for them, they expected you to live in the community and participate in the community. Right. Very yeah. strong. You know, Middletown's changed a little bit in the years since in that uh, we've lost that local ownership and uh, it was a very strong business uh, education partnership in this community, both at the public school level and at the higher education level. 
Could you tell us the names of some of the companies that were here? Well, there was Armco Steel, of course, was the largest, but there were several uh, locally owned uh, paper oriented there companies. There were like 10 or 15. Right. Paper and fortunately, some of those are still here, but there was, yeah. there was the Gardner Harvey, yeah. basically manufactured boxes. Um, you had the Sword Paper Company, you had the Wren Paper Company, you had Raymond Bag, you had Crystal Tissue, um, you had Linden mm -hmm. Container. Um, uh, you had Aronka, which was in the aerospace uh, airplane making business. Uh, it was a pretty diverse economy here, and that, that gave Milltown quite a strong economic underpinning. Well, this community has been blessed for many, many years. When I came to this community in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, um, everybody was involved. You know, when I say everybody, I mean as we discussed, uh, John talked about Armco being involved in all the paper companies, but they expected their people to be involved too. And it was just, we were just blessed with people that, and not big companies, uh, you know, just individual people uh, that stepped up to the plate. And I'm just thinking of the Dave Finkelman Auditorium. I mean, he was a, just a realtor here in town, but everybody kind of stepped up to the plate and made this campus what it is today. Well, let's talk about the effort to create a campus here. Why did people want a college in this town? Well, I think it started at the state level with the governor yeah. wanting regional campuses. The governor Rhodes was a very <clears throat> uh, ambitious governor perhaps why he lasted so many terms, but he wanted an airport in every county, which was accomplished, and I think he wanted a regional campus of the state universities within yeah. so many miles of every potential student. And uh, luckily for Middletown, we were the first. And I think one of the reasons is that we had the industrial base supporting it ready to go, and uh, Armco very generously gave all the land for this beautiful campus. Uh, it had been their employee park for many years prior to that. So uh, the resources were here. The location was halfway between Cincinnati and Dayton. It, just, it was fairly close to Oxford, the home of Miami. So it, it was an ideal situation. And um, I think the people in the community uh, uh, said, hey, that's great, higher education for more people. And uh, they jumped on board. Well, in addition, Barry Levy was, in, was a state senator here at the time. And he and Governor Rhodes were very good friends. And uh, Barry had a lot to do with getting funds to start this first, uh, from the state, uh, to start this first campus. So we were, we were blessed with talented people. Excuse me, I, Barry later became chairman of the uh, Miami Board of Trustees. Yeah. Down the road. Yeah. So he was super, and one of the buildings here is named after him. So he was really right. involved. Yeah, the thing is about employee, not only financial contributions, but their time and being encouraged by the company. That was the company top to bottom. So not only did management encourage employees to participate in all sorts of nonprofit boards, all the 501c3s throughout the community, but the top management folks themselves led that charge, if you will, by doing it themselves as an example. We have some newspaper articles about the first meetings. Um, a, a wonderful lady named Evelyn Day, I believe, Day. was one of the people who said, we have to get this done. Do you have any Evelyn Day stories? Do you remember that? I remember her but I, and the work that she did, but I, I don't have any personal stories. What kind of work she did she do? She was an executive assistant at yeah, Armco yeah. for upper management. Yeah. I don't know that she was necessarily Mr. Johnston or Mr. Verity's assistant, but he, she, was she was involved at a pretty high level. Yeah. Okay. And so I heard there was a meeting called in town. A few people showed up, and then everything took off. Do you remember some of the conversations that you might have heard? Well, back in those days, Middletown had a group of about a dozen of the leading business people mm -hmm. that met on a frequent basis to discuss community challenges and 
goals and so forth. And uh, Armco and the paper companies had people sitting at that table and the Chamber of Commerce and uh, the hospital and other leaders mm -hmm. met on a frequent basis the banking community to get things done. And I'm sure that's what it was referring to. Can you specify any of the names of the people or well, the companies? Well, from the banking community, there was uh, Calvin Verity from, uh, and Ed Barker Ed from Barker. First National mm -hmm. Bank. and uh, Russell Weatherwax uh, from the right. Bank One, Barnett's Bank. Of course, from Armco at that time, I believe Logan Johnson was the chairman, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he was. It Johnson Hall's named after, and yeah. uh, he and his people uh, were, there was a Charlie Murray and B.C. Houston who were very involved in community mm -hmm. affairs. On, that was their responsibility at Armco. And um, the paper companies, there was the Driscoll family and um, Aronka, the Lawler family, and mm -hmm. of course the Gardeners. And well, and a lot of the attorneys people. and, uh, yeah. you know, Elliot Levy, which was Barry Levy's father, he was very involved. Um, and the professional people, uh, in the community, and, and you were kind of expected to take a part <clears throat> in the community. You know, it was just, no one told you that you had to, but I was in business, and had a CPA firm here in town, and you just, you know, you felt like you had to contribute uh, to the community, because everybody else was contributing. We had a lot of people move here um, from other parts of the country seeking employment. Um, do you recall any programs to help them feel at home or any community centers or meeting places that were active then before the campus opened? Well, we did have a lot of relocation in Middletown because not only were these industries here, their home offices in many cases yeah. were here. So we had a lot of management people here. Armco, for instance, John, you can speak to this better than I can, but they had like seven steel mills around the country at that time. So they would transfer their people. I was in the real estate business. My family was in real estate for 75 years here, and we represent a lot of those people as they came to town. I remember back in the 80s, they bought an insurance company called Belfont. I think they moved 80 families in here one year, so that was a real big It was a regular thing, thing in, and yeah. in and out. In and out. Yeah. It people. wasn't all in. But there was transfers out to other, in Armco's case, other Armco plant communities and some office communities too. In fact, uh, worldwide, uh, there were people coming in from other countries and locals, if you will, going well, you had out in the world. Department an international division was headquartered here in Middletown. So, does that create a? Um benefit to local businesses if we can train our talent locally at the MUM campus? Well, it certainly does, yes. And, and the other important thing with the MUM campus is it allows people to work and go to college and, and get an education that maybe can't afford to go to Miami, uh, Oxford, and uh, you know, they can still work, have a family, and get education, and that's extremely important to this local campus. I think that's one of the goals that Governor Rhodes had when yeah. he, he brought this idea to the table, accessibility and affordability. And that's still true. <coughs> uh, these campuses make it possible for a lot of young people to go to college that might not consider it otherwise. So I'd like to talk about the opportunities. The planning committee did not want this to be a technical school. They wanted a liberal arts university. Um, what's the difference for Middletown between the two? Liberal arts or just technical skills? Well, I think the, the technical skills prepare you for workforce development, a specific job. Now, this was back in the 1960s. Things have changed as far as what people want from education. And I think the company's probably leadership would have changed too at this point. And then the liberal arts, of course, is a broader spectrum of education, which at one time was thought the only way to go. But if you're in pre-law or pre-med, certainly that's what you want. Miami was 
kind of perceived to be a liberal arts school, although they did have engineering and <coughs> architecture and so forth. So um, it would be interesting to have a conversation with the six, 1960 folks as to what they wanted and, and what the industry today would want. It might be two different things. And I think I'm that's, sure. I think uh, we look at, you know, <coughs> um, we now have a Cincinnati State campus, which is perceived more technical, I guess, and then Sinclair and Butler Tech and the, the county vocational schools. And then there's Miami. And, and I think Miami's, you know, still leans to be more of a liberal arts institution. So although they have nursing and other things, um, it's, it's an interesting question. And I, I think times have changed and the needs have changed. Well, but Miami's changed with them. That, that's been a good thing. Well, times have changed. Back in the 60s, actually, the high schools prepared people for manual jobs. You know, carpentry, automobile repair. That was part of the uh, high school program. You could kind of go one way or another, which they, the high school, I don't think does this anymore. But, you know, so the, Miami, this campus was created more for a higher academic rather than the uh, trades. Uh, I think that's what it was geared for, you know, 50 years ago. I'd like to change pace now and go back to the comments that individual people were very much involved in making this campus happen. And I'd like to know more about Mary O'Neill. Can you tell us about her as a person and what motivated her? and? What did she accomplish? Well, <clears throat> that's a little difficult. Uh, none of us sitting around here knew Miriam Knoll. Um, she was a very private lady that lived here in town, obviously a very wealthy lady, very frugal lady. Um, and uh, she, from what I understand, um, didn't have many friends. Um, she had been married, her husband had passed away. She had a lot of money and uh, she, uh, she created the Miriam Knoll Foundation in 1985, um, but it wasn't funded. And uh, even though I was, I was one of them, I, Barry Levy, Ron Ely and myself were named as the, the uh, the advisor to the advisory committee. I never met Miriam Noel. Uh, and we uh, thought you had. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I never met her. Uh, and why she picked my name to be on the advisory committee? Probably as a result of Barry Levy. But anyway, um, then at her death in um, 1992, February, or November 1992. Then her funds went into the, to her foundation. But prior to that, she, um, the Middletown Community Foundation was just getting started. And they had a fund drive. And uh, they went to Mary Knoll, and, and she said, uh, they said, uh, or she asked, how much you're trying to raise? And they said, $2 million. And uh, she said, I'll contribute $2 million. So she helped start the <laughs> Middletown Community Foundation, too. So the rest of her funds went into the foundation. And uh, over the last 20 years, uh, the foundation has contributed over $6 million to this community. And, uh, Miami being the probably the biggest benefactor, um, so that's kind of a brief history of uh, what, so it, so far, Mrs. Noah has contributed $8 million to this community. And, and it has been just in this community. And we've heard, Bill, maybe just through you, but her driving theme, if you will, is she just wanted to do good for Middletown. Right. Maybe I heard it from Ron Ely, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And she had a few favorites. Uh, yeah. from Miami and the community and um, Abilities First and, you know, some really needed charities yeah. here in town. Now, we've tried to, 
as a committee have tried to uh, honor her name and uh, also contribute to charities that, in, including her two churches. She had a Middletown Methodist Church and the Monroe Methodist Church. We still make annual contributions to those two churches. We've tried to follow through her wishes. I'd like to talk about the community center here that's been added to Johnston Hall. Were you involved in that expansion? And can you tell us the story John and of that? I, were on the, yeah. on I, I forget what, what year was it they decided to build that. I'm trying to remember. It's been here longer than you think. <laughs> yeah, it's before my Noel time. Yeah. That was up and going. I don't when think I, that, came I don't think board. it's ten years old. What maybe? Pushing it. Is yeah, it? probably yeah, pushing it. Okay. Well, Miami yeah. was having a fun drive here in Middletown, and uh, someone had asked my wife and I, Pat, to be on the committee for the fun drive, and I asked Ron Ely to co-chair with us because I knew. Ron knew where the money was, because uh, he was a trust officer with uh, First National Bank. And um, I forget to fund the gold, it was something like $4 million or something like that. But um, things were kind of tough, and uh, we were coming short, and we went to John Sawyer and <laughs> said, so, you, you know, of course then the three of us made up the committee. And, uh, uh, you know, unless we kick in a lot of money, this is not going to happen. So. Yeah, and the rest is history. It was, you know, as beautiful and comprehensive as this campus was, they really didn't have a student center here. They had a canteen of sorts and a meeting place for students. Yeah. They really didn't have any place yeah. where you could have dinners or programs and uh, other than the auditorium, which didn't fulfill all the needs. So. It was really needed not only for Miami, but it's used by the greater community also for activities. Mm -hmm. Well, and John has said over the years, um, the Knoll Foundation has sort of been a gap filler. You know, here was a fun drive that was not going to quite make it, and and we've come up, stepped up, not we, the Knoll Foundation has stepped up and fill those gaps. I think we've been a little more nimble than, than some yeah. of the larger foundations which have 20 members on a board and it takes cutting through the red tape sometimes to get the monies for Noel. We're a smaller foundation with yeah. a small board and we're able to act pretty quickly for and emergencies and or really A change that, true that needs. took place was <clears throat> some time ago, I'll call it the old days, although it hadn't been that old, Armco used to be that gap filler. Yes. And the sure. Armco Foundation yes. and stepped up to a lot of <coughs> campaigns and activities, uh, community building yep. activities, mm -hmm. and then that wound down when Armco headquarters left, yeah. and there was a, <laughs> a gap of gap filler, sort of, yeah. and the Knoll helped uh, fill that role. Well, back in the 70s and 80s when Armco and steel industry in general had somewhat of a demise in this country and of course that affected Middletown, they started selling some of their steel companies and other assets to survive. It became apparent to the Armco leadership and the community leadership that they needed to do something. At that time, Elliot Levy, um, who was Chairman McGraw Construction and a prominent attorney here in town along with Bill Verity who was chairman of Armco and grandson of the founder of the company got together and started soliciting the community for funds to build the community foundation. The Middletown yeah. Community Foundation started as a result of a perceived need by Armco and other businesses that hey we're not always going to be here to help the philanthropic side we're going to need help. So the community, once again, the private sector came together and, and started yeah. and raised substantial monies, which Miriam Knowles Foundation was a part to get this foundation up and running so that Middletown could enjoy the quality of life uh, to which they were accustomed, even though the industrial side wasn't going to be able to contribute like they once had. 
we, by the early 90s, we had in Middletown all three types of foundations. The Knoll had started rolling as a private foundation. Uh, the community foundation had, had gotten going in the 80s, and the uh, Armco Foundation is a big one, it's a corporate foundation. So those are the three types of foundations. And the Knoll was just coming on board, and actually Community Foundation was coming on board at that time also. Mm -hmm. And the Armco Foundation is a corporate foundation was winding down. Yeah, so. you know, for a town of 50,000, uh, an industrial town of 50,000, it was remarkable we were able to gather the resources to keep the quality of life pretty good here. So, uh, Milltown was fortunate. Some of our sister communities weren't quite as fortunate. That's right. Yesterday we talked to uh, Mr. Kraft about the downsizing that occurred and also Ms. Stewart um, of what it was like to let go so many employees during the 70s. Um, do you recall any community needs or opportunities during that time of the, the downsizing of so many factories and how maybe Miami Middletown filled some of those needs? You know, Middletown gets a lot of flack these days for not being the community it once was, but quite frankly, for basic needs, I think our health care, um, our job availability, I think it's still pretty good. There's still an awful lot of product that's made in this town today. Now, people don't live here quite in the numbers that they once did because Cincinnati and Dayton is growing close. They're gro those communities are growing closer together, and, and we're part of that. It, if you worked in this town, you used to live in this town. That was your only choice. But now there's so many other communities and choices that right. we have. We've had to compete a little. Yeah, that was that was very true. We wouldn't hire anybody unless they moved to Middletown in our firm. That was a request made up front, and uh, so consequently, you had you know talented people always coming in. It was not a bedroom community back then. What kinds of industries do we have in Middletown now? Well, we have <clears throat> Acres Packaging, which is a good-sized packaging company. And we've got a lot of... Cohen co Recycling. Cohen, and Cohen Recycling. You have a lot of suppliers <clears throat> to the steel mill here. This, Even though the home office is no longer here for Armco, they still have one of the most modern and largest steel mills in the country here and it employs a couple thousand people. Uh, Premier Health out of Dayton now runs the hospital here, Atrium Health Center, but it employs about 1,500 people. So, uh, and you know, the, the jobs that used to be in the mill are now high paying, sophisticated jobs. I mean, you don't get a job in a steel mill today unless you have some engineering and computer capabilities. And That's a change uh, from being able to work there without being able to read. That is correct. That's correct. Can you talk about that change in, in workplace requirements? Well, being in business, Bill's an accountant. I'm a realtor. John was a, uh, a corporate executive. I mean, we see we have seen change. I mean, you have to you, today at least you have to have a certificate, if not a two year degree, to get a job. As we go around the community and talk to our friends and cohorts in business, we find, though, that the real problem they have today is the soft skills. They don't know how to shake someone's hand. They don't know how to interview. There are drug problems. Yes. They don't show up for work. These are This is what we hear from industry today. They'll teach a young person what they need to know as far as on-the-job training, but they can't find those character skills. There seems to be a real void in that today. Yes, you're absolutely right. And drugs are an important well, issue factor. of this factory. <clears throat> yeah, and I'm not sure if you learn learn those things. It has more, I think, to do with upbringing and yes. your early environment, family life, and so on. To answer your question about how does Miami fit into there, I think 
if a young person's fortunate enough to get into Miami and go to school here, I think some of the character lessons take care of themselves. You know, mm -hmm. Merritt Miami's always had very high standards for a state school, and uh, you know, if it, if someone gets here, I think the end result is going to be pretty terrific. What you're describing is a change in um, the role of the campus from the 1960s to the 21st century. So now it seems like we need to do more um, human development. What would you hope that we focus on now to prepare people for the next 10 or 15 years of employment? Well, I think one thing this campus can do, you know, all too often, this isn't, isn't Miami Middletown by itself, it's, it's most regional campuses, uh, especially one where we don't have residents here, we don't have dormitories. The students come in their car, go to class, and then go home. And I think they miss that campus experience where the social interaction is so important. And I think this campus is starting to take steps to improve that. And the community center is part of that because it gives them a place to meet and interact. Yeah. Yeah, another thing this campus provides, I think, to the community is, is a social gathering center, if you will, for community residents. In particular, Finkelman. Uh, unfortunately, the orchestra is on its way out <laughs> this weekend. Uh, the you Noel Community Room, a place where events are held and you get together with folks for dinner or reception that you don't normally chat with or they aren't your next door neighbor necessarily but but they're there and part of the Middletown community and you're getting together with them. Well this campus so, has definitely brought a cultural element to the yes, community and that's great. that we would not have had otherwise. I mean that yeah, the yeah. artists and lecture series that Miami's had There's this another one. Here, it's brought uh, musical performances in here we we would have had to driven to Cincinnati or Dayton for them to pass. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's been pretty successful over the years. So <laughs> it's definitely not just academics. There, there's a broader mm -hmm. program here. So Yeah, and, and that was one of the things that interested the Knoll Foundation in helping with the Miriam Knoll Community Foundation is we it was not only a campus need, but it also filled a community need. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we uh, was important to us in helping us make the decision to fund that uh, building. Okay. Um. And you know, as we talked about before, you know, John mentioned the, the artist series and so forth. You know, it's like the Casper lecture series. You know, people in the community are still mm -hmm. still funding things that are so here at the campus that are so valuable to um, the Casper Lecture Series have had tremendous amount of talent come to this town. And, um, you know, that there's still, people are still participating in, in this campus. It's not isolated alone. Yeah, I think Middletown, again, for a small town, had an unusually strong quality of life. And I think Miami's been the cornerstone of that, frankly. Yeah. in Middletown. So we've talked about how the original vision for this campus has been fulfilled. What do you hope this campus focuses on in the next 50 years? What should we retain? What should we expand upon to serve the community? Well, I think the most obvious is trying to fill the jobs that are available in the community to meet the needs of industry here. I mean, again, this is an industrial town. That was why the campus was here in the first place. But I also think there's a greater responsibility in the university to try to build strong citizens for the future. And I think, I think now that you can get four-year degree here, I, I just think that's going to broaden the whole atmosphere. Yeah. I really do. It's going to make it a, a, an even stronger campus. I think it's pretty much fulfilling their needs for the times. You know, it's changed over the years, but for the times, uh, in the beginning, it was sort of just a uh, stepping stone to Oxford, and uh, now it's developed into sort of its own own university. 
I think there are some students here now that come here by choice, not because yeah, they yeah. can't afford it, yes, or oh, because right. it isn't. Ex they're coming here because this is the type of campus. This this is a different campus than Oxford, and that's great. And if if you want to go to Oxford, you can go to Oxford. What's the difference? Oh, I, I just, well, socioeconomics play into it a little yeah, bit. Yeah. It's a different type of students. A student is probably working their way through school as opposed to one that maybe isn't. There's nothing wrong with that. There's, that it's good for everyone. Yeah, it's a non-traditional. And, and I think there are certain students who are a lot more comfortable in that in a middle town than they would be in Oxford. And that's great for Miami. It just opens them up to more. And I think when we have the nursing school here and the MBA down in Westchester and other programs in Hamilton, it just broadens Miami's uh, footprint for this whole area. I mean, Miami is the Southwestern Ohio State University. And so they they need to step up and fulfill their responsibility. And I think they are. Well, it, is, it fits better for, I, can re I didn't mention my grandson goes here. Uh, but, you know, when he got out of high school, he could have gone to Miami or wherever he wanted to go. But he chose to to go here uh, for a few years. Now, he tells me he'll be go probably going over there next year, but this gave him a sort of a little end to college life, and uh, you know, I think now he's ready to move into Oxford. I think one thing too we take for granted sometimes is our, our Milltown High School is right across the street. Those students can come over here during their high school career, sure. take college courses, they can start out as sophomores almost. It's a really great program. I'm not sure it's taken advantage of sometimes as much yeah. as it should be. I think we're really working back on track, but what a great <laughs> integration that is. And uh, that's a great opportunity for yes, young people. You know, you were speaking of jobs and so on. And, and filling them for fulfilling. And rather than just waiting to see who graduates and where they go work, there has been in the past numerous uh, advisory committees of representatives from local industry. Mm -hmm. And it's both their management folks, their engineering or technical folks, and their HR folks. And I think that's critical. It's much quicker to react to what they advise rather than waiting to see where graduates go work. And, and I think that, I hope that's still going on. I don't know if it is, frankly, um, in many cases. I believe it is. I have two more topics I'd like to talk about. Sure. Um, having listened to you, you've inspired these questions. We are now offering degrees in entrepreneurship. And sometimes it feels like we're preparing Middletown for 1918, 1910, all over again, starting the next wave of big companies. Um, how do we help the community welcome these new graduates with entrepreneurship degrees? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think you need to get some of our industrial people, whether it's a plant manager or a CEO for a company, to come in here and maybe uh, teach some of your courses, not on a full-time basis, but at least to interact with the students. I think the business school partnership can be strengthened and grown. Mm -hmm. And these young people today, uh, I don't know how much cooperative education there is here at Miami, uh, but that is an, that's very strong in a lot, especially a lot of business schools today, where you take courses for a semester and you work a job for a and semester. And you see. Yeah, well, UC was the sure. founder of that, but I mean, that yeah. a lot of students, it gives them a job while they're going to school, and it also gives them a job when they graduate. The university benefits because it, it makes those industrial people more involved than they would be otherwise. We need to get the business people on the campus more in some yeah. fashion, either teaching or programs. I think, I think there needs to be more of a business education partnership on this campus. Yes. And I, I don't. I don't think that would take home that much. I think. I think the business community. All you have to do is ask them. Well, you know, yeah, and there may have to be some changes because <clears throat> I know in the early years a lot of our staff people, not a lot, but I know one. He taught here. I know Bill Thorne, who's a, another Miami graduate that lives here in town, has his accounting firm. He taught here. But I understand now that you can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, one of our retired partners, uh, Tom Hazelbaker, uh, 
he, he went to Wright State, and he's teaching accounting three days a week. And it's great for both parties. And it's great for both parties. I mean, he has 35 years of business experience in the accounting right. field. And he can, he can relay that to the students a lot better with his, his experiences. And I think it would be great if, I don't even know whether you teach accounting here, no, I guess, you probably do. do. Mm -hmm. But um, it would be great if you could use some of the talent here in Middletown, even on a part-time basis. So it brings a record, practic it brings a practical practic side yeah. into it that they, you don't necessarily get out of the textbook. For our, for regulation purposes, I need to enter into the record that Mr. Hazel Baker's teaching experience at the uni um, at Wright State has been documented in a newspaper article out of date, and so yes. that's public knowledge just for the regulatory sure. records. That's, that's so that's correct. why we can mm -hmm. mention Mr. Hazel Baker's name. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't think he would mind, but. Just for the record. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, so. I yeah. taught for 10 years after I came to town. Did you? Mm -hmm. yeah, but it was at UD, mm -hmm. University of Dayton High School. And how did that happen? I was asked to do it. I had no idea of doing it after I'd been in school for nine years full time. And I got here and I said, oh, I finally finished with school. I had done some teaching in graduate school. And someone out of the Dayton community said, say, how about, and I said, sounds interesting. Sure. Worked out well. I love doing it, continuing to do it. All right. Thank you for the inspiration. I'll pass this information on. Um, my second question concerns health care, because we did talk about health issues for the town. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the uh, old hospital and the conversation to build the new hospital? Do, do you recall any of that? Well, there was a connection with Miami because the old hospital had a nursing school, which was not unusual back in the 20s and 30s uh, for hospitals to have nursing schools. In fact, some still do. Yeah. And at some point uh, after this campus was built, uh, the nursing school at the old hospital became the Miami nursing school here on this campus, which was a great thing. I think it even kicked everything up a notch and attracted yeah. more people. And, it's been a good thing. And now that's out on the new campus next door to the current hospital. There is the nursing. It's called Green Tree Academy. And that's been a great thing for Miami and great thing for our health care in this community. It's given us nurses access to nurses that larger communities would like to have because there is a demand for nursing. So we've been and Miami is a big part of that. But the old hospital uh, was built in the 20s, I believe, or I think so. after the yeah. flood of 1913. And yeah. A train wreck over here is what caused the hospital to be built here. The <coughs> hospital, like the Miami campus here, had tremendous community support. And again, Armco, Mr. Verity, the founder, he was the catalyst that brought all everybody together. To, and the hospital was always a very integral part of this community with a very strong volunteer group supporting it, which it continues to enjoy today. So Miami has been part of this hospital thing. And of course now the hospital is no longer Middletown Regional Hospital. It is now one of several hospitals owned by the premier health system out of date as we regionalize our health care. Now, while you're sitting here, I'd like to do something that historians would just absolutely love to have. We have names of people on newspapers and on buildings we don't know what their personalities were like, what made them laugh. So can we go through some of the people who have names on buildings and just let people know what were they like when they were not sitting at their desk? Um, so Mr. either of the Mr. Levies, Mr. Verity, we have a statue, but could you animate him for us and tell us what he was like, Mr. Johnson, anyone that you can think of? Well, Mr. Verity, George Verity, statue right. was out on the front of campus here that was moved from, from the campus of the steel company. Um, I know none of us really had the pleasure of knowing him. It was before our time. We knew yeah. his son, Calvin, who was president of the bank, okay. and we knew his grandson, Bill, who uh, was very active in this community and later became president of uh, the National Chamber of Commerce and also uh, Secretary of Commerce in President Reagan's cabinet. And Bill was a community kind of guy. He was 
very personable and whether he was out yeah. in the steel mill or out in the community, Bill always had a handshake and a friendly smile and he, he, he cared about Middletown. And as far as uh, Logan Johnston, who the building over here, the classroom building is named after, he was like the fourth or fifth uh, president, which would now be CEO of Armco, and he was the CEO when this campus was built, and he was a very dapper man. I believe his background was sales at Armco, and that he came up the ladder and uh, became He was a, a very outgoing mm -hmm. fellow. I, I got to know him, not in Middletown, but in Pittsburgh, and I happened to be at a meeting with another one of my uh, research compatriots at Carnegie Mellon and Logan was there and he went out of his way to get a hold of us and show us around though he knew a lot about Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. and uh, that's how I got to know him not well, middle his town, but nephew Pittsburgh. Harry Holliday later became yeah. president of Armco so there's a lot of family connection mm -hmm. and um, you know unfortunately we didn't know some of the other na the names here the Gardner family was a large family and yeah. I think there were three or four brothers yeah. Who founded and led the company? Uh, um, the last one to leave here was Ames Gardner, who was more sales oriented. But uh, the Gardner family was very active in the community for many, many years. And uh, the Gardner Harvey name on the library, Mr. Harvey, he was sort of in charge of the product development at the Gardner paper. He was an engineer, very bright man. His daughter, or his granddaughter, Sarah Kalp, still lives here and is very involved in the community. I did not know Mr. Harvey. Uh, yeah, I did not. I, 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 did not I knew know. his uh, daughter. The uh, old line that we're talking about here, uh, most of those have moved out of the community and, and their families have moved out. You know, even the Verity family, uh, you know, Bill Verity's three children, you know, they, they moved out of Middletown, and uh, we haven't been able to keep uh, a lot of the, the lineage. That's yeah. true. The lineage. And I think that happens to most corporate well, families after does. four or five generations. It's yeah. really hard to yeah, keep them here, particularly with the company. There was a time in Armco when Middletown was indeed an Armco town. Oh yeah, that's what oh, we're yeah. talking about. And interesting to me, there are still today, yet today, some of those company towns big companies uh, left around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Dow, Dow Chemical. Dow Chemical, Midland, Michigan. Midland, Hershey, uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania. Hershey, uh, Timken up in Canton, Ohio, actually DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware, and, and more. Yeah. Yeah. So it can be done. Yeah, it yeah, can, it be, can I, be done. I'd sort of like, to, I'd like to take a course about company towns <laughs> that are in existence today and the pluses and minuses and the changes that are going on. I think that would be fascinating, and I not think everybody it, likes the company. Not no, I know. I mean, Armco was damn if they did, and damn if they didn't. I mean, I know for that for all they did for the community, the there were there yeah. were jealousies that they were too yeah. dominant yeah. at times. Yeah. That's just human yeah, they nature. Were accused of yeah. being too controlling. Right. Thank you. Um, that that was actually very enlightening. You said Mr. Holiday is Holiday House named for him? No. No. Oh. Because a historian would make a connection. Right. All right, just right. checking. And then uh, one other thing we've been developing this week is uh, when the ladies were at Armco Girls, what were the gentlemen doing? Working. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I don't know. Who knows? Times have changed, haven't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. We understand that these were wives of Armco employees, but also women who worked at Armco. Mm -hmm. And they had a place to go to for overnights. So when they were doing overnights, what were the men doing? Yeah, I think it was more female employees actually than wives. So, yeah, I think uh, for the Armco I'm... Women Association or whatever it was called. I don't. I don't. That's. A, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just wondering. Yeah. Um, Good question. So, these are the questions that I had prepared coming into this interview. Um, are there any other things that you think future researchers should know about the first fifty years? Well, I got one current one I want to bring, a complete outlier. You probably, you've probably heard enough about our old man's tennis group. Mm -hmm. But we have a group of 12 to 15 old guys, 60 to 90. We play tennis regularly year-round. We play down here at Mum. 
and really appreciate those courts being available to the community. We're just a mix of characters and we play at the tennis club inside from October through April and then just now we're in transition but we play three times a week on campus and to a man this group really appreciates the availability and having those courts there for the community so I just want to bring that up and thank Miami for providing those <laughs> for us, if you will. Well, it, it was a real asset for me, the Miami campus. Um, I was in real estate for 40 years. Our business was selling Middletown, especially back in the heyday when the corporations moved people in and out of town. I would get clients and on, uh, first of all, you have to sell them on the community. And part of that is a tour of the community. And I always came to Miami because it was such a quality operation and uh, it was a pleasure to help sell Middletown through Miami. And uh, all I can say is I would like, I, Miami has been involved in the community. I'd like to see them get even more involved because I think it's good for both sides. Yeah, John, I would agree. <clears throat> yeah, I would like more involvement from Miami too, also. Can you give me any ideas to take to committees? Well, I think getting back like, we, and we're businessmen, so we're kind of, you know, prejudice in that regard, but to get the business community more involved here on campus, and I, and I think it would not only help the students learn the practical side of things, but it would help with your fundraising down the road. Um, I don't think either side makes enough of an effort to get together. No. And unfortunately, I think Miami's the one that's got to initiate that a little bit to make it happen. Okay. Whether you like it or not, people, a lot of people are intimidated by higher education, and I think, I think you, you need to reach out and uh, get people involved. It's a, it's a new community, it's a little different community, but it's a big part of this Cincinnati Dayton thing. Middletown will have its day again, and part of that is the education. You know, we've got great education resources here for a small town, but it could even be better, and I think Miami should be a leader in that. 